the Land Rover Series I, II, and III are off-road vehicles produced by the British manufacturer Land Rover that were inspired by the US-built Wheelers Jeep. In 1992, Land Rover claimed that 70% of all the vehicles they had built were still in use. Series models feature leaf-sprung suspension with selectable two- or four-wheel drive. Though the Stage 1 V8 version of the Series 3 featured permanent 4WD. All three models could be started with a front-hand crank and had the option of a rear power takeoff or accessories. Development The Land Rover was conceived by the Rover Company in 1947 during the aftermath of World War II. Before the war Rover had produced luxury cars which were not in demand in the immediate post-war period and raw materials were strictly rationed to those companies building construction or industrial equipment, or products that could be widely exported to earn crucial foreign exchange for the country. Also, Rover's original factory in Coventry had been bombed during the war, forcing the company to move into a huge shadow factory it had built during the war in Solihull near Birmingham to construct aircraft. This factory was now empty but starting car production there from scratch would not be financially viable. Plans for a small, economical car known as the M-Type were drawn up, and a few prototypes made, but would be too expensive to produce. Morris Wilkes, Rover's chief designer came up with a plan to produce a light agricultural and utility vehicle, of a similar concept to the Willys Jeep used in the war, but with an emphasis on agricultural use. He was possibly inspired by the Standard Motor Company, who faced similar problems and were producing the highly successful Ferguson TE-20 tractor in their shadow factory in Coventry. More likely, he used his own experience of using an army surplus jeep on his farm in Anglesey, North Wales. His design added a power takeoff feature since there was a gap in the market between jeeps and tractors. The original Land Rover concept is similar to the Unamog which was developed in Germany during this period. The first prototype had a distinctive feature a Euro the steering wheel was mounted in the middle of the vehicle. It hence became known as the center steer. It was built on a Jeep chassis and used the engine and gearbox out of a Rover P3 saloon car. The body work was handmade out of an aluminium magnesium alloy called Burma Bright, to save on steel, which was closely rationed. Paint was also in short supply, resulting in the first production vehicles making use of army surplus green paint. The first pre-production Land Rovers were being developed in late 1947 by a team led by engineer Arthur Goddard. Tests showed this prototype vehicle to be a capable and versatile machine. The PTO drives from the front of the engine and from the gearbox to the center and rear of the vehicle allowed it to drive farm machinery, exactly as a tractor would. It was also tested ploughing and performing other agricultural tasks. However, as the vehicle was readied for production, this emphasis on tractor-like usage decreased and the center steering proved impractical in use. The steering wheel was mounted off to the side as normal, the body work was simplified to reduce production time and costs and a larger engine was fitted, together with a specially designed transfer gearbox to replace the Jeep unit. The result was a vehicle that didn't use a single Jeep component and was slightly shorter than its American inspiration, but wider, heavier, faster and still retained the PTO drives. The Land Rover was designed to only be in production for two or three years to gain some cash flow and export orders for the Rover company so it could restart up market car production. Once car production restarted, however, it was greatly outsold by the off-road Land Rover which developed into its own brand that remains successful today. Many of the defining and successful features of the Land Rover design were in fact the result of Rover's drive to simplify the tooling required for the vehicle and to use the minimum amount of rationed materials. As well as the aluminium alloy bodywork other examples include the distinctive flat body panels with only simple, constant radius curves and a sturdy box section ladder chassis which on series vehicles was made up from four strips of steel welded at each side to form a box, thus cutting down on the complex welding operations required when making a more conventional U or I section frame. Series I, Land Rover entered production in 1948 with what was later termed the Series I. This was launched at the Amsterdam Motor Show. It was originally designed for farm and light industrial use 
and had a steel box section chassis, and an aluminum body. Originally the Land Rover was a single model offering, which from 1948 until 1951 used an 80-inch wheelbase and a 1.6-litre petrol engine producing around 50 a bhp. The four-speed gearbox from the Rover P3 was used, with a new two-speed transfer box. This incorporated an unusual four-wheel drive system, with a freewheel unit. This disengaged the front axle from the manual transmission on the overrun, allowing a form of permanent 4WD. A ring-pull mechanism in the driver's footwell allowed the freewheel to be locked to provide more traditional 4WD. This was a basic vehicle, tops for the doors and a roof were optional extras. In 1950, the lights moved from a position behind the grille to protruding through the grille. From the beginning it was realized that some buyers would want a Land Rover's abilities without the Spartan interiors. In 1949, Land Rover launched a second body option called the Station Wagon, fitted with a body built by Tickford, a coach builder known for their work with Rolls-Royce and Lagander. The body work was wooden framed and had seating for seven people. Tickford was well equipped in comparison with the standard Land Rover, having leather seats, a heater, a one-piece laminated windscreen, a tin plate spare wheel cover, some interior trim and other options. The wooden construction made them expensive to build. The Tickford was taxed as a private car, which attracted high levels of purchase tax unlike the original Land Rover. As a result, fewer than 700 Tickfords were sold, and all but 50 were exported. In 1952 and 1953, a larger 2.0-liter petrol engine was fitted. This engine has Siamese bores, meaning that there are no water passages for cooling between the cylinders. During 1950, the unusual semi-permanent 4WD system was replaced with a more conventional setup, with drive to the front axle being taken through a simple dog clutch. Around this time the Land Rover's legal status was also clarified. As mentioned above, the Land Rover was originally classed as a commercial vehicle, meaning it was free from purchase tax. However, this also meant it was limited to a speed of 30 mph on British roads. After an appeal to the law lords after an owner was charged with exceeding this limit, the Land Rover was classified as a multi-purpose vehicle, which was only to be classed as a commercial vehicle if used for commercial purposes. The 1954 model year brought major changes. The 80-inch wheelbase model was replaced by an 86-inch wheelbase model, and a 107-inch pickup version was introduced. The extra wheelbase was added behind the cab area to provide additional load space. 1956 saw the introduction of the first five-door model, on the 107-inch chassis known as the station wagon with seating for up to 10 people. The 86-inch model was a three-door, seven-seater. The new station wagons were very different from the previous Tickford model, being built with simple metal panels and bolt-together construction instead of the complex wooden structure of the older station wagon. They were intended to be used both as commercial vehicles as people carriers for transporting workmen to remote locations, as well as by private users. Like the Tickford version, they came with basic interior trim and equipment such as roof vents and interior lights. The station wagons saw the first expansion of the Land Rover range. Station wagons were fitted with a safari roof, which consisted of a second roof skin fitted on top of the vehicle. This kept the interior cool in hot weather and reduced condensation in cold weather. Vents fitted in the roof allowed added ventilation to the interior. While they were based on the same chassis and drove trains as the standard vehicles, station wagons carried different chassis numbers, special badging, and were advertised in separate brochures. Unlike the original station wagon, the new in-house versions were highly popular. Wheelbases were extended by 2 inches to 88 inches and 109 inches to accommodate the new diesel engine, to be an option the following year. This change was made to all models with the exception of the 107 station wagon, which would never be fitted with a diesel engine, and would eventually be the last series I in production. The diesel engine was slightly longer than the original chassis allowed so the extra two inches were added in front of the bulkhead to accommodate the new engine. These dimensions were to be used on all Land Rovers for the next 25 years. Finally, in 1957, 
the spread bore petrol engine was introduced, followed shortly by a brand new 2.0 liter diesel engine that, despite the similar capacity, was not related to the petrol engines used. The petrol engines of the time used the rather outdated and let over exhaust valve arrangement. The diesel used the more modern overhead layout. This diesel engine was one of the first high speed diesels developed for road use, producing 52 HP at 4000 rpm. Series 2, the successor to the successful Series I, was the Series 2, which saw a production run from 1958 to 1961. It came in 88er in and 109er in wheelbases. This was the first Land Rover to receive the attention of Rover's styling department chief stylist David Back produced the familiar barrel side waistline to cover the vehicle's wider track and the improved design of the truck cab variant, introducing the curved side windows and rounded roof still used on current Land Rovers. The Series 2 was the first vehicle to use the well-known 2.25-litre petrol engine although the first 1,500 or so short wheelbase models retained the 52 HP 2.0-litre petrol engine from the Series I. This larger petrol engine produced 72 HP and was closely related to the 2.0-litre diesel unit still in use. This engine became the standard Land Rover unit until the mid-1980s when diesel engines became more popular. The 109-inch Series 2 station wagon introduced a 12-seater option on top of the standard 10-seater layout. This was primarily to take advantage of UK tax laws, by which a vehicle with 12 seats or more was classed as a bus, and was exempt from purchase tax and special vehicle tax. This made the 12-seater not only cheaper to buy than the 10-seater version, but also cheaper than the 7-seater 88-inch station wagon. The 12 seater layout remained a highly popular body style for decades, being retained on the later series and Defender variants until 2002, when it was dropped. The unusual status of the 12 seater remained until the end of Euro. Such vehicles were classed as minibuses and thus could use bus lanes and could be exempt from the London congestion charge. There was some degree of overlap between Series I and Series II production. Early Series 2 88-inch vehicles were fitted with the old 2-litre petrol engine to use up existing stock from production of the Series I 107-inch station wagon continued until late 1959 due to continued demand from export markets and to allow the production of Series 2 components to reach full level. Series IIA, the SII and the SIIA are very difficult to distinguish. There were some minor cosmetic changes but the most significant change was under the bonnet in the guise of the new 2.25-litre diesel engine. Body configurations available from the factory ranged from short wheelbase soft top to the top of the line five-door station wagon. In 1967 a 2.6-litre inline six-cylinder petrol engine was introduced for the long wheelbase models which also have servo-assisted brakes. 811 of these were NADA trucks which were the only long wheelbase models made for the American and Canadian markets. From February 1969, the headlamps moved into the wings on all models, and the sill panels were redesigned to be shallower a few months afterwards. The Series IIA is considered by many the most hardy Series model constructed. It is also the type of classic Land Rover that features strongly in the general public's perception of the Land Rover from its many appearances in popular films and television documentaries set in Africa throughout the 1960s, such as Born Free. In February 1968, just a few months after its manufacturer had been subsumed, under government pressure, into the Leyland Motor Corporation, the Land Rover celebrated its 20th birthday, with total production to date just short of 600,000, of which more than 70% had been exported. Certainly it was whilst the Series IIA was in production that sales of utility Land Rovers reached their peak, in 1969 a Euro 70, when sales of over 60,000 Land Rovers a year were recorded. As well as record sales, the Land Rover dominated many world markets in Australia in the 1960s Land Rover held 90% of the 4A, full market. This figure was repeated in many countries in Africa and the Middle East. Series IIA Ford Control The Series IIA FC launched in 1962 was based on the Series IIA 2.25-litre petrol engine and 109er in chassis, with the cab positioned over the engine to give more load space. 
Export vehicles were the first Land Rovers to get the 2.6-litre petrol engine. Most examples had an ENV rear axle, a matching front axle came later. Tires were large 900A, 16 types on deep dish wheel rims to spread the ground weight of this heavy vehicle. These vehicles were somewhat underpowered for the increased load capacity, and most had a hard working life. Less than 2,500 were made, and most had a utility body, but surviving examples often have custom bodywork. With an upgraded powertrain, they can be used as a small motorhome. Series IIB Ford Control The Series IIB FC produced from 1966 was similar to the Series IIA Ford Control but added the 2.25-litre diesel engine as an option. The 2.6-litre engine was the standard engine for this model, the 2.25-litre engine being only available for export. Heavy-duty wide-track axles were fitted to improve vehicle stability, as was a front anti-roll bar and revised rear springs which were mounted above the axle rather than below it. In the process the wheelbase was increased to 110 in. Production ended in 1974 when Land Rover rationalized its vehicle range. Many IIB components were also used on the 1 ton 109 in vehicle. Series 3 The Series 3 had the same body and engine options as the preceding year including station wagons and the one-ton versions. Little changed cosmetically from the IIA to the Series 3. The Series 3 is the most common series vehicle, with 440,000 of the type built from 1971 to 1985. The headlights were moved to the wings on late production IIA models from 1968-9 onward and remained in this position for the Series 3. The traditional metal grille, featured on the Series I, and IIA, was replaced with a plastic one for the Series 3 model. The 2.25-litre engine had its compression raised from 7.1 to 8.1, increasing the power slightly. During the Series 3 production run from 1971 until 1985, the one millionth Land Rover rolled off the production line in 1976. The Series 3 saw many changes in the later part of its life as Land Rover updated the design to meet increased competition. This was the first model to feature synchromesh on all four gears, although some late H suffix SIIA models had used the all synchro box. In keeping with early 1970s trends in automotive interior design, both in safety and use of more advanced materials, the simple metal dashboard of earlier models was redesigned to accept a new molded plastic dash. The instrument cluster, which was previously centrally located, was moved to the driver's side. Long wheelbase Series 3 vehicles had the Salisbury rear axle as standard, although some late SIIA 109-inch vehicles had them too. In 1980, the 2.25-litre petrol and diesel engines received five main bearing crankshafts to increase rigidity and the transmission, axles and wheel hubs were strengthened. This was the culmination of a series of updates to the transmission that had been made since the 1960s to combat the all too common problem of the rear axle half shafts breaking and heavy usage. This problem was partly due to the design of the shafts themselves. Due to the fully floating design of the rear wheel hubs, the half shafts can be removed very quickly without even having to jack the vehicle off the ground. The tendency for commercial operators to overload their vehicles exacerbated this flaw which blighted the series Land Rovers in many of their export markets and established a reputation that continues in many markets to the present day. This is despite the 1982 redesign that all but solved the problem. Also, new trim options were introduced to make the interior more comfortable if the buyer so wished. These changes culminated in April 1982 with the introduction of the county spec. Station wagon Land Rovers, available in both 88-inch and 109-inch types. These had all new cloth seats from the Leyland T45 lorry, soundproofing kits, tinted glass and other soft options designed to appeal to the leisure-only user. Of more interest was the introduction of the high-capacity pickup to the 109-inch chassis. This was a pickup truck load bay that offered 25% more cubic capacity than the standard pickup style. The HCPU came with heavy-duty suspension and was popular with public utility companies and building contractors. Stage 1 V8, from 1979 until 1985, 
The Stage 1 was built using some of the same components as the Range Rover and 101 Ford Control, such as the LT95 gearbox and 3.5-litre Rover V8 petrol engine. The engine was detuned to 91 HP from the 135 BHP of the contemporary Range Rover. The Stage 1 was normally available only in LWB 109-inch form but 24 examples were built with the SWB 88 in wheelbase. Stage 1-inch refers to the first stage of investment by the British government in the company to improve the Land Rover and Range Rover product offerings, which eventually led to the Land Rover 90 and 110. The use of the Range Rover engine and drivetrain made it the only Series 3 vehicle to have permanent four-wheel drive. 1 ton 109 inch, the 1 ton 109 inch was produced from 1968 to 1977, covering late IIA and Series 3 models. It was basically a Series IIB Ford Control built with a standard 109 in body, featuring 2.6 litre petrol engine, lower ratio gearbox, ENV front and rear axles, though some late IIAs were fitted with ENV axles in front and Salisbury on the rear. Later series IIIs had a rover type front axle with uprated differential. The chassis frame was unique to the model and featured drop shackle suspension similar to the military series Land Rovers. 900x16 tires were a standard feature and these machines were commonly used by utility companies and breakdown recovery firms. Only 170 IIA and 238 series IIIs were built for the home market. Export markets had even fewer examples, making this one of the rarest types of Land Rover ever built. Australia Australia has always been an important export market for Land Rovers of all sorts, but especially the utility models. 80-inch Series I models were sold to the Australian government in the late 1940s for work on civil engineering projects such as dams and road construction, which brought the vehicle to the buying public's attention. Large sales followed and in the 1950s Land Rover established factories in Australia to build CKD kits chipped from the solar hull factory. The Land Rover continued to sell well throughout the 1960s in Series 2 guys, commanding some 90% of the off-road market, and with practically every farm having at least one Land Rover. The Series 3 continued this success in the early 1970s, but from the middle of the decade sales declined. A large coal export deal to Japan relied on the subsequent import of Japanese cars and other goods, a combination of this increasing competition and increasingly poor quality of the components being shipped from Britain meant that Land Rover's dominance slipped. A problem specific to Australia was the always limited supply of new Land Rovers. Leyland's factory never had the capacity to meet possible demand and the need to import almost the entire vehicle and kit form from Britain restricted the supply and manufacturing process further. This led to a long waiting list developing for the Leyland product whilst commercial operators could receive large fleets of Japanese vehicles very quickly. The other problems faced by Land Rover were the same throughout its export markets compared to the Japanese competition, the Land Rover was underpowered, unreliable and slow with a poor ride quality, despite their superior off-road ability. Poor rust proofing and low quality steel used in comparison to the Japanese vehicles turned the buyers away in large numbers and by 1983, with the introduction of the 110, the Toyota Land Cruiser became the best-selling 4A, 4 in Australia. In the early 1980s, Land Rover Australia had made some changes to the vehicle to try to combat this sales decline. As well as the fitting of the V8 petrol engine in the 1979 Stage 1, as in the rest of the world, Australia also received the same vehicle with the option of a 3.9-litre 97hp four-cylinder Isuzu diesel engine. This was introduced in 1982, and was meant to be equipped in about 10% of the Australian production. Top speed is 77 mph. This helped slow the sales decline, but the rest of the vehicle's shortcomings let it down. The 110 was also available with this engine, and a turbocharged version producing in excess of 100 horsepower powered the military 6A. 6. South Africa South Africa's relationship with Land Rover started in 1949 when the first Series I 80 inch models were sold in South Africa. In August 1950, 
Car Distributors Assembly Limited assembled the first Land Rover CKD in Port Elizabeth, South Africa. The first local production of fuel tanks and chassis at the Port Elizabeth plant was announced in August 1963 and from then on the local content in the production of Land Rovers increased steadily to 44% of vehicle weight by 1972. Local content included, chassis, road springs, entire body, tires, seat frames and upholstery, battery, fiberglass roof and all glass. In 1974 Leyland SA had three assembly plants. Local content increased further in 1980 with the Series IIS models fitted with locally produced petrol, R6, and diesel, ADE 236, engines. In 1992 the Blackheath factory in the K province was identified as the largest Land Rover CKD assembly outside the UK. Military, Britain the British Army used Series Land Rovers in large numbers. The British Army tested the 80-inch Series I Land Rover almost as soon as it was launched in 1948. At that time, the Army was more interested in developing a specially designed military utility 4A-4. However, the Champ proved too complex, heavy and unreliable in battlefield conditions so the Army looked to the Land Rover. In the late 1940s the Ministry of Defense was keen on the standardization of its vehicles and equipment. Part of this plan was to fit Rolls-Royce petrol engines to all its vehicles. A batch of Series I Land Rovers were fitted with Rolls-Royce B44 cylinder engine, which required modification to an 81-inch wheelbase. However, the engine was too heavy and slow revving, which stunted performance and produced torque that the Rover gearbox could only just cope with. Rover convinced the MOD that, considering the quantities of Land Rovers they were considering ordering, that the standard 1.6-litre engine would suffice. The MOD started ordering Land Rovers in batches from late 1949. The initial batches were for 50 vehicles, but by the mid-1950s the Army was buying Land Rovers 200 vehicles at a time. Land Rovers were deployed to the Korean War and the Suez Crisis and became standard light military vehicles throughout the Commonwealth. However, as the 1960s progressed, more and more specialized versions were developed. As well as the standard GS vehicles, a common variant was the FFR Series 2 and Series 3 chassis. A well-known version was the LRDPV, commonly called the Pink Panther, on account of their distinctive light pink sand camouflage. These 109-inch Series IIs were stripped of doors and wind screens and fitted with grenade launchers, a machine gun mounting ring and long-range fuel tanks and water tanks. They were used by the SAS for desert patrol and special operations. By the late 1970s, the British Army had acquired around 9,000 Series 3 models, which were mainly a special heavy-duty version of the 109-inch soft top. These models had improved suspension components and a different chassis cross-member design. These were produced in 12-volt GS models and 24-volt FFR versions. A small number were 88-inch GS and FFR models, but in general the Army used the air-portable 1.5-ton, 88-inch lightweight version. The lightweight was in service by many armies all over the world. In Europe even the Dutch Landmacht and the Danish Army used the Land Rover lightweight. Instead of the petrol engine the Dutch and Danish lightweights had diesel engines. Instead of the canvas top the Dutch ones are PVC tops like the modern Land Rover Wolf. In addition, there were also 101-inch Ford control models, 109-inch FV1806-7 ambulances built by Marshall Aerospace of Cambridge. The Royal Navy and Royal Air Force also acquired and maintained smaller Land Rover fleets during the 1960s and 1970s. The RAF used 88-inch models for communications, liaison, personnel transport and airfield tractor duties. The Royal Navy's fleet was, understandably, small and consisted mainly of GS spec and station wagon versions for personnel and cargo transport. All British military Land Rovers used the 2.25-litre four-cylinder petrol engine. However, some overseas customers specified the 2.25-litre diesel unit instead. The Land Rover is also the basis for the Shoreland Internal Security Patrol vehicle developed by Short Brothers. Australia The Australian-made Series 1, 2, 
2A and 3 were widely used by the Australian Army, Royal Australian Navy and Royal Australian Air Force. Most were GS mobility vehicles with variants built as long-range patrol vehicles, ambulances, command reconnaissance cars, fire tenders and ceremonial vehicles. The first was delivered to the Army in 1948 and the Series 1 gradually replaced the World War II-era Austin Shons and Jeeps. The Series 2 was introduced in 1958, the 2A in 1963 and Series 3 in 1973. 72 of the Series 2 were fitted as an anti-tank gun buggy with a 106mm recoilless rifle. The Land Rover Parenti, a military variant of the Land Rover Defender, was introduced in 1987. Over 2,500 four-wheel drive and 406 wheel drive remain in service. New Zealand The New Zealand Army purchased 640 of the Australian-made Series 1 between 1951 to 1953. A similar number of Series 2 were purchased in 1959 to 1962 and a small batch of Series 2A in 1965 to 1967. New Zealand purchased a small number of ex-Australian Series 2 and 2A vehicles in 1971-72, out of the pool used by the ANZ UK force in Singapore. 566 of the Series 3 were purchased in 1982-83 and as of 2012 around 320 of these remain in service. Minerva Minerva of Belgium produced a version of the Standard Vanguard, under license from the Standard Motor Company. When Belgium's army needed a lightweight 4A, 4 vehicle, the head of Minerva, Monsieur Van Roggen approached Rover in the spring of 1951. On June 21, Rover discovered that they were competing against Willis Jeep for the contract. In October 1951, the deal was agreed and in 1952, the Minerva Land Rover was produced. The Rover company supplied technical support for Minerva and allowed Minerva to produce Land Rovers under license to Rover. Arthur Goddard, Rover assistant chief engineer and head of Land Rover development was in charge of approving the changes Minerva wanted to make to the Land Rover as well as setting the factory up to assemble the vehicles. See also, Land Rover Defender, the continuation of the series, light utility vehicle, references. External links, Land Rover official website, Land Rover at DMOZ, Land Rover clubs at DMOZ.